So what I wanted to do today was, you know, let's let's kind of open it up a little more. We're going to have our panel members talk about like how to assemble from based on their experience, how to assemble a competent, if not uh, vastly superior uh, performance team. So this could be uh, at a university level. So maybe the athletic director is looking for somebody to hire to put this together at a professional level. level it's the GM that's looking to put somebody in charge as a performance director at an Olympic level or a national sport level. It could be, who do we put in charge of volleyball, basketball, the ski team, so that we make sure that all the medical, all the performance, all the sport science is in place, and it's all well managed. So it's not only this question of bringing people together and assembling a team like the Avengers, but it's making sure everybody gets along and you don't have the Hulk going nuts on everybody, um, you know, while they're fighting crime. So that's what I want to, I want to get at is what are the pieces and then how do we make sure the pieces interact and actually produce a result? Because you could bring all these people together and it could just be a gong show. And, um, you know, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? How do we make sure that we get a positive result uh, in the final analysis? So we have Tracy, we have Rob Panarello, we have um, Chris Roof, and they all have sort of separate, different um, involvements on that level and understand how these organizations work. Uh, we're going to have Bob Alejo jump in as well. And anybody else, quite honestly, please jump in, even if you just want to unmute yourself and say something. I want to open it up and keep things moving. Um, but I'm going to start with Rob Panarello because Rob and I always talk about this issue and Rob has gone through this, if, if Rob wants to share this evolution of like, you know, creating a business, creating a company, growing the company, making sure you have good people in place. And then now he's the CEO and he's looking at, you know, all of these operational issues that are going on and making sure that we get a good product on the back end. But it's, it's a lot of work, as he'll tell you. So Rob, uh, can we start with you? I'm just gonna, uh, oh, you're, you're unmuted there. So let's just start with your kind of basic um, analysis of, of where do you start? Yeah, well, um, for this conversation, I guess you're talking about teams, right? And I think that you have to find people who are qualified at the level that you're addressing. So you may have a really good college strength coach or athletic trainer um, that maybe wouldn't be appropriate for the professional levels because they're not as good dealing with an adult, not that college people aren't adults, but versus an 18 to 22 year old. You know, it's a, def it's a definitive different population. Um, I just think that you don't always have to have the best people. And I think that's uh, surprising when I make that statement. Um, I think that you, you're limited by budgets at times. And if you're at a institution or a professional team that just prints money and you could hire wherever you want sometimes getting the best people doesn't need doesn't mean as you stated before you're going to have a blend and so i think it's very important that you get people that could do the job and i think it's very important that you know what you're going to get out of them day in day out so you may not have the best athletic trainer in the conference of the league or the best strength coach in the conference in the league etc but when you know what you can get out of each person and they deliver every day and you put everybody together, you'll have the best team. And, that, and that's important. It's about people working together versus, you know, the New York Yankees are a franchise that's obviously well-renowned, um, more world championships than anybody, but they had a lot of teams where they just picked the best players and, and didn't win, you know? So, I just think it's so important for people to be able to work together as a team and leave egos at the door. And that said, everybody's got an ego and it's okay. That's probably why you got to that level. But uh, the other thing I think, and, and it may upset some people for me to say this and may not, but the athletes are, the athletes are an investment and you have to look at it as such. And so, you know, if they're in the pros, they're getting paid a lot of money. If they're in the college, they're, they're on scholarship and, and that investment has to be on the field. And you don't treat them like an investment, you treat them like a person. But I think as you put this team together, I think the person in charge has to be well-rounded enough to have some kind of understanding for the topic we're speaking of today, of strength and conditioning, of rehab, of 
working with doctors, and very importantly, being organized and being a leader. And there's a difference between leading people and standing behind them and pushing them forward. And, and getting everybody to work together and getting everybody to want to be better. And, you know, like Coach Parcells used to say, success isn't always final, but failure could be. And you just have to keep getting better and keep working with this communication and, and evolving. The, an outlier to that is if this person in charge also understands business, that may assist in regards to showing value in dollars and cents to an athletic director, to a GM, to an owner, right? If someone, to keep the math easy, if someone's making 1.6 million a year in the NFL, and they're making $100,000 a week, and they're supposed to be back in six weeks, but the medical team working with the return to play and the strength and conditioning staff can get them back in four weeks, you just saved the team $200,000 of someone sitting on a bench versus paying someone for productivity. And those are viewpoints that you can look at and put into a perspective to the owners and the GMs and the ADs as well to show the value of your team financially. So, you know, I'll stop there, but we can go in any direction you want. But bottom line is, is that, you know, you've got to have people that can do the job and that can work together well and cannot be satisfied where they are. They always have to be able to continually improve for the betterment and the sake of the athlete to protect that investment. And if you don't protect that investment, then you've also protected your position. So. Okay. Well, that's a good start. And uh, I, we're going to jump back to you because I'm going to, I was going to first ask, like, who do you hire to lead this? But I'm going to switch it on Tracy here and put her on the spot. I'm going to say, Tracy, what is your, what is your argument for you or some like, you know, even if it's just um, sort of a hypothetical, but you want to tell somebody like, I can take this high performance director position because I have these qualities. What are some of the qualities that you're going to put forth to say, I know what's going on here. I can lead this group. Well, I would say most importantly, you have to have kind of an emotional IQ about managing people and leading people and wanting to be an advocate for them with regard to um, maybe the general manager of the director of athletics or the CEO of the NGB, um, that you have a, a nice uh, generalist view of sports medicine, uh, strength and conditioning, nutrition, sports psychology. And this is kind of speaking more from a, uh, a, an NGB Olympic view because that's my, my personal background. Um, you have to really want to create a performance, a high performance culture. And you, gotta, you have to be a generalist. You really have to be a generalist. And you, then you have to have some expectation and hold your people accountable so that you get people back into training and you don't have injuries and, you, and you're really trying to be best in the world. You don't just say that, but you're actively working toward that. So, so for me, when, when, when the, the person in charge is not really uh, a people person, um, that, that's a, that seems to be a challenge in my mind, my own experience. I'm going to open this up to both you and Rob. Um, do you have to be a medical person? Like, is that advantageous? Like, and I want you guys to be honest here. If it is like, I want to know, um, do you have to be uh, a physical therapist with a medical background? Do you have to be a medical doctor? Is that a better choice? Uh, do you guys want to tackle that? I'll, I'll start with Tracy and then Rob, you can, you can pick up the football. I mean, you can, I don't think you have to, I think you have to, have it like I said, you have to be a generalist. You have to understand professional uh, ism, professional ethics, and you're trying to find people that hold themselves accountable to the highest standards. Um, I just think you have to have an understanding of, of medical care and sports medicine care and try to help your staff be the most, you know, in in the forefront of what you're trying to do, but I don't think you have to be a medical person. Sometimes if you are a medical person, that might limit your scope and your worldview a bit. That's my own personal thought. Rob, what are the advantages of being medical? 
uh, from a the medical the background. You know, to make an analogy, the old saying, if you throw a pass, three things can happen and two of them are bad, right? So you, you, have this, you have these three layers, basically, and a lot falls underneath each layer. So you have strength and conditioning, and you know, maybe under strength and conditioning or corresponding with strength and conditioning could be sports science, nutrition, et cetera. You have athletic training, and that may include physical therapy and massage therapy, et cetera. And you have the physicians, right? So if you have a medical background, you've tackled, as long as, as Stacy's saying, and I really can't tell you the, the importance of both leadership and communication, as she has stated, um, you've, you've, you've knocked out two of the three if you have a medical background. Now, that said, I don't think you have to have a medical background. I think that you have to be the generalist, as she says. You have to have the understanding of the components that you're going to deal with. And more importantly, you know, be able to, to put together all these departments as one unit as a team. And that obviously is leadership, communication, you know, obvious, probably some type of experience where you've had to do that before and those types of things. I think it helps you if you have a medical background because it's two of the three, but I don't think it's necessary either. I think the other aspects are more important, organization, leadership, and the ability to make people work together. All things being equal, um, if you had a, a, somebody who has a coaching, strength coaching background, performance background, then you have somebody who has more of a rehab medical background, and you have to pick one of those people to promote to lead the group, all things being equal, if they're pretty similar in terms of, you know, your scorecard, are you even just by human nature going to pick the medical person because the people above might think that's more credible, you know, biases and all? Well, uh I don't know. You know, I'll see what, what Tracy says. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Again, I'd go, you, you, may be, you may be the same in regards to your real good strength coach or a good, real good athletic trainer. But, you know, I think you, the leadership is going to be different. Communications is going to be different. Those types of variables, there are going to be differences. And if they're both equal in, in their professional aspects of skill, those other things are going to be the deciding factor. The other thing I will tell you is this. I believe there can only be one leader right? There can only be one chief. And that person has to be the full, a full-time employee of the organization. So like, I wouldn't make, and no, no offense to team physicians, I wouldn't make a team physician in charge of this uh, program unless they were a full-time employee of the university, because then you're in it. Then you're in it 100%. Your job's on the line, you're doing it for the athletes, et cetera. If, if you're doing this as an outside consultant, just because you're a physician or a or consulting strength coach or consulting physical therapist or athletic trainer, then if things go awry, you still go back to your practice or your, your other business. You can't possibly be in it like a full-time employee. So that would be my other requirement. The person in charge of this program has to be a full-time in this venture. They can't be an outsider who comes in just based on credentials. But that does happen, right? That does happen. Like we have this expert, he's going to come in and tell us what, what, you know, where we're going to go, what direction, but they're not, they don't have the same skin in the game. Well, I think they could come in as a consultant and leave. I don't think they could be there year round telling everybody what to do. Yeah. I don't. Okay. Uh, we're going to throw it over to Chris Roof. Now, Chris, um, would you feel comfortable if somebody said, Chris, we're going to put you in charge of everything. Would you feel comfortable in your interactions with uh, the surgeons, uh, the rehab professionals? And how, how would you make that work, given that you're more of a, a performance background person? Well, I think if I was in that chair, I'd have to make sure that I had whoever was heading up the athletic medicine side of things was really, really good and could kind of cover my back on some of those areas. Um, that's certainly not my strong point of my skill set. Um, but if, if I had somebody that could let me know, Hey, um, this is what you need to look, look for going into those meetings. Um, here, uh, here's some key talking points to visit with the surgeon on that would be helpful for me. Um, but yeah, that's certainly not my area of expertise. I think it's something that can be learned as you go through that process. But, uh, at the end of the day, it's like any, any promotion up, uh, I don't think that person, when they're promoted, they may think they're ready to sit in that chair, but they're never ready to actually sit in that chair until they've had to go through it for 
for a year or two years, three years, whatever it may be. Yeah. And, um, I mean, Rob touched on this a bit. Like when you, when you have people working below you, do they need to be followers or can they have significant leadership qualities? Do you worry that, you know, Hey, I may get shown up because I hear a lot of that, that spoken about a lot is that we need people who are going to fall in to line. What are your thoughts on that in terms of the people you're hiring below you? Well, I think when, uh, when you're in a meeting with your staff or, or whoever's in your department and it's a closed door meeting, then, you know, I, I agree with Rob, there needs to be, there needs to be one person that's in charge and, and uh, they're going to have the final say. And there should be, there should be discussion and debate and not everybody should agree if they're all sitting in there in a meeting trying to come to a solution to a problem. But once everybody walks out the door, whatever is decided is the final say everybody's on the same accord and that's what we're going with. And there's no um, uh, chatter kind of on the fringe or, or behind people's backs about this or that. Uh, we make a decision. That's what we're going with. And we're all behind it 100%, even if you don't agree with it. And when we're interacting with other members of the department or our athletes, we're all on the same page. And then uh, as far as worrying about somebody showing you up or something along those along that lines, I think if you're hiring people, you want to hire people that can do your job better than you can, because that will push you to, to grow and, and evolve and stay current. Uh, I think if you're hiring people that don't have the potential to be better than what you you are, then I think the department's going to suffer as a whole and become pretty stagnant. Yeah, good good point. Um, one thing I wanted to ask the three of you was um, if you had sort of, not I'm not going to say unlimited budget, but if you had the resources, would you be trying to put people in different positions and fill like, do you have to have somebody who handles the sports psychology side? Do you have to have a separate nutritionist? Um, do you think it's important to designate those positions and, and make sure you have your sports scientists, uh, your data scientists, you know, all the, the it, it can be pretty, pretty big. Um, but how important it is, is it to have those positions? And let's start with Chris because I know you've kind of looked at those types of issues as well. And, and you may even have those people in place already, but how important is it to have these separate areas covered by individuals? I think it's pretty important if the, if the budget's there to support it um, and the, the manpower and leadership is there to support it. I think it's, it's pretty critical to do that. Uh, you, you end up bringing in people that can be more of an expert in their role and field and bring more value to the department uh, and uh, by them by them being at a very very good at their job and their role that helps uh, trickle down I think to the rest of the department and staff whether they're a, a athletics medicine or sports medicine uh, performance coach um, we're all going to learn from each other so I think it helps to have those individuals that with the with the uh, specialized backgrounds with with the ability to be a little bit of a generalist as well, as Tracy said. Yeah, so let's, let's bounce it to Tracy. Tracy, um, have you been involved in, in performance teams or you've had these different um, oh, yes. areas built? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we had uh, wonderful dietitians. We had wonderful strength and conditioning coaches. We had wonderful athletic trainers and physical therapists working alongside each other. And then we had... Um, you know, Bill Sands, we had sports scientists um, specifically, and then uh, sports, a variety of sports psych people. And so having experts in all of those fields um, was really cool at times to, re to learn from those people and really um, work as a team to address the athlete's needs. Uh, that was fantastic and you just you just really gained a lot of respect for um, other professions and how how they can help you do your job better and really create this atmosphere of support for the for the athletes and put the athletes first so I would say yes I mean if you you get the the, the best you can hire they don't they might not necessarily be um, have the greatest resume but if they fit into the the team or they bring something to the team they don't have to fit exactly be the same you know as your culture but they add to your culture uh 
that's always helpful, but bringing in that expertise was, uh, I think, paramount to success and really ha having people who knew what they were doing. Nice. Rob, uh, I want you to speak to this. And what are the dangers of things getting too big and unmanageable? I know one of the, one of the fellows we know who worked for uh, an NHL team, um, they did a mass hire and they had all these positions and they bought all this technology and, and it got out of hand and it, it didn't really work out. What, what, what are the dangers and the caveats of, of building this massive team with all these specialists? Well, first of all, I think the person in charge has to do the hires. So for instance, if I hire the athletic train, if I'm in this position, I hire the athletic trainer and the AD hires the strength coach. One is may not have been the selection of the person that I wanted. And that's the person I have to work with every day, not the AD. Two is that person will be more loyal to the AD than they will for me. And that's not going to work if you're trying to create a team environment. If you in this position want to hire the head strength coach, the head athletic trainer, the sports scientist, and allow them with information provided to you to hire the rest of their staff, I don't have a problem with that because essentially they're either going to hang themselves or reward themselves with that rope that you gave them. But I think it's imperative that the key people in the organization have to be hired by this person, not by a head coach, not by an AD, not by a GM. All right. Um, if you have the budget, then I would think you can only go as far as you can control the situation. And all hires have to know exactly what Stacey, Tracy said before. You have to know what your responsibilities are. You have to be accountable to those responsibilities and you have to know who you directly to report to. And uh, if, if you can't do that with this type of growth and it, it starts to get out of control, generally it starts to get out of control because there's um, a breakdown in the organization, right? No accountability no reporting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you're, you've got to set this plan. And if, you, if you're limited by the talent in the plan, then that's where you stop, right? If you can continue to grow because you have that talent to supervise, to hold accountable, all these things, then you can continue to grow. Great. Uh, Ryan, Banta, you wanted to jump in and make a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Chris said, which is the idea that, you know, the idea, once we make a decision, we need to move forward with it. But I also think that it's important with that concept that there needs to be a specific time that your team, if you've hired a bunch of good individuals and they do add to your culture, you need to respect those people to help you make some of those decisions. One of the things I've found in teams of coaches or groups of people that get together is this kind of echo chamber situation where one person makes a statement and it could be the wrong statement, but then that's the direction that we go without any kind of back and forth or that you provide that opportunity. So like with my staff, we would meet once a week in a sit down setting where we could have those conversations back and forth about the things we need to have and the ways we can get better throughout the week, you know, and then they can come to me with that criticism and I make it known ahead of time. I want that criticism as soon as you feel it's appropriate to give, give to me. I do not want to wait. I do not want it to be out there hanging out there because then we can't react to it. But once I've pondered on it or made that decision as a leader of the group, then that's the direction we're going to go. And then every day after practice, we have more of an informal ups and downs of the day, things that we saw, things that need to be better. And we kind of take tabs of that and then have a bigger conversation later. And I think that that's really important. You know, you want everybody to be on the same, on the same page, but you also want that page to probably have a little bit of writing from some other people um, when it comes to the, you know, overall program, or you shouldn't hire those people if you don't value their opinion. Yeah, the whole yes man thing. Um, I'm going to bounce it back to Chris because Chris, uh, when I was at Baylor, Rob was there as well. We did a visit. Um, you guys would have these meetings and I want to ask you like, how important is it to have these staff meetings and these sort of check-in periods? How frequent should it be? And I know we were involved in one and the great thing is we guys had this whole Festivus feast, feats of strength thing happening occasionally, but you know, how do you how do you schedule that and and what do you try to accomplish in those meetings when you're meeting with your performance team without wasting time or just going through the motions we uh try to meet as a formally once to twice a week we try to get twice a week if we can and uh a big part of the first meeting will usually be any uh kind of minor updates and small news and things that people need to know are going on and then we'll touch on uh 
three to four more big picture, uh, bigger target items that are more longer term pro uh, projects. And we'll work on those. Uh, the second meeting will be a, a little bit if there's anything we need to touch on from the past couple of days and then focus a little bit more on staff education and development. Um, we'd like to be able to meet face to face either in smaller groups or as a whole group in a, informally uh, throughout the week if, if we can. But uh, the way everybody's schedules get, that gets to be a little bit harder. Uh, I think when you guys were there, um, everybody was kind of a little bit more in one spot. So we ended up having those, those informal meetings or debriefs very regularly. And uh, that, was a, that was a big part of professional development and learning for all of us, I believe. Yeah. Do you feel like people in your meetings uh, feel comfortable kind of bringing up maybe uncomfortable issues? Like maybe like, I, you know, we need to get better at this or, you know what I mean? Like, is that an issue? Do you think people go to the meeting and just kind of clam up and then just get through it? But maybe there's some deeper issues that hadn't been discussed. How do you, how do you approach that? Well, uh, we just uh, re overhauled our meeting format uh, a week ago based on the recommendation of a couple of our staff members. So um, I think they're comfortable with that, uh, you know, and that's we've been doing things a certain way for a long time and, and it got presented to us. Hey, we think this can be more efficient of everybody's time and and uh, keep a better record of good things going on. So uh, we're giving it a go and um, we want we want our staff to to be, feel free to speak up and if they don't agree with something to say it um like i said if we're all in there agreeing on the same thing it becomes that echo chamber like like ryan said and nothing gets accomplished then you have this false perception that you're accomplishing things but you're really just uh kind of gravitating towards the status quo if you're doing that yeah because i think right now with social media it's very easy for everybody to slap each other on the back and say hey we're doing a great job and you know, oh yeah, we're, we're awesome. But I think those conversations have to be had about like, hey, how can we get better? Um, you know, maybe we're not paying enough attention to this particular item. Does anybody else want to jump in about that? How do you conduct that level of communication without offending people? And I sure, and it, it all also has to do with context. Like Rob said, if, if you have people that are hired by different people, the factions can develop pretty quickly. Um, does anybody have any comments on that in terms of how you build that level of trust so that people can have open conversations? I think you have to have the meetings. I think you have to meet minimum weekly in regards to the overhaul of, of every, all departments together. I think you have to listen. I mean, one thing I've learned, if I ever want to know anything that's going on in a hospital, I spoke to the janitors that were cleaning up the operating rooms because they would hear all the doctor conversations. If I want to learn anything about what's going on my teams, I would talk to the equipment managers. You got to, you've got to go to the, you know, the people wearing the boots on the field, and those are your, your coaches, you know, all the time working with the players as well. So you got, you have to have their input, and you have to have their opinion of things. But it doesn't mean you have to ex take it. And if 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 you're not going to take their opinion, and if you're not going to go by their idea, I think they have the right, and they do deserve the reasons why you don't, because that's an education for them as well. All right. But I've always went by me and myself, whoever had the best idea, it didn't matter where you were on the, the hierarchy level. That's the idea we went with. Um, and you're not going to get those ideas unless you meet. I think you also have to have a meeting, a minimum of biweekly meetings in these types of environments where you would assign tasks to people from an educational aspect. If we're weak on X, okay, so-and-so, I want you to just review the literature, talk to people, whatever, how do we get better on X? And let's have meetings in regards to the weaknesses we've identified and what we're going to do to correct those weaknesses, which is different than meeting to have all the departments provide information and input to work better together. So you know, that's, that's what we did. Yeah, when you, and it goes back to this leadership issue too. If you're a strong leader, then you're, you're probably you know, asking for criticism of, about yourself too, right? You're saying, Hey, how can I be better? And then the other, there's two, that's a two-parter and I'll let Rob talk, do it first. How do you invite criticism of yourself in a constructive way? Uh, but also are you kind of ob observing how your team is working together and can you spot where conflicts are brewing and then how do you resolve those and how do you bring them up into the open rather than letting them fester? 
I think you have to establish lines that can't be crossed, but one of those lines can't be that you're not approachable. And as long as you're approachable courteously and professionally, you should be able to accept any conversation. Um, and that, that comes with trust over time. I think the other thing that's very important is that when your staff does a good job, they need to be rewarded. And that may not always be financially, or at times that may be financially, a la bonus or you know, a gift card. Small things go a long way. But if, if you're gonna be a me kind of person, you're not gonna go far. And the problem with the people who are me kind of people that wanna be in the spotlight, they don't realize, in my opinion, is that if you put the spotlight on individuals that do a good job, it makes you look better. Because people say, God, this person in charge knows how to develop a staff. And as your staff goes on over time to take this same position, head up a position like this at other individuals, with other schools, I mean, institutions, pro teams, whatever, now you've got your legacy. And then when things come around, they'll say, you yeah, know, we need somebody. Call Coach Roof, because look at all the people he's put out there. Call Coach, you know, call Tracy. Look how she's successful she's been because you've given the credit and developed the people underneath you versus being a me person. And I, I can't tell you how important that is, in my opinion, that you've got to reward. And it does, like I said, it could just be praise. And it could be letting the athletic director or the GM know that your assistant strength coach came up with this idea. And that's why your players are so much better in this part of an equation. People should get credit for the work they do. It's not, a, it can't be, it's all due to me. Does anybody else want to expand on that? How do, how do people um, reward, you know, their, their staff and what are, what are some good ways to do it? Chris, how do you, how do you guys bring, bring these types of positive qualities out to light without making other people feel like, well, you didn't, you didn't praise me too. You know, like everybody's egos are quite sensitive. Oh. Um. I think we try to get our individuals involved in as many things around the athletic department as they can handle um, and, and put them out in the forefront with some things. So uh, whether it's they're doing a presentation in front of 50 athletic department members on uh, applied performance or, or uh, uh, building a team or things like that, we try to give them opportunities to do that. So I think uh, in strength and conditioning, the perception is, also, is often – you know, it's all just those meatheads down in the weight room. Um, and we'd like to be able to show the rest of the department, you know, we have a staff that's got an unbelievable amount of differing skill sets and, you know, uh, pretty well are pretty well-rounded individuals that bring a lot of value to the department and more importantly to the well-being of our student athletes. So that may be, um, you know, uh, Stacy Skidinski on our staff has been involved in a bunch of initiatives to uh, put women's health at the forefront, educating our student, our female student athletes on um, female health and wellness uh, items that are, you know, that they may not get without, without hearing it from uh, members of the athletic department. Um, Josh Nelson, our applied performance director, doing things to, from a branding and social media standpoint and, and uh, PowerPoint presentations that you can see throughout the, the building and department uh, bring some again health and wellness actionable health and wellness items that that coaches can see that that staff can see and ident uh, immediately connect with and say I can see where that would help our student athletes or or myself personally that's great um, I, I guess the good point there was even just making people visible by putting them in these situations is probably a positive thing like hey everybody knows what you're doing and uh, all the good work you're doing. So by, by putting them on that platform, I think that's, that's a really good idea. Tracy, um, you wanted to jump in, but I, I want you also to speak to an item next is how do we evaluate people? Like wh what's the scoring system? What are you looking at? But, you know, I'll, I'll let you tackle a bunch of things there. Um, well, I just wanted to say uh, when you do um, thank your staff, you need to, it needs to be like genuine and authentic and, personal because there's there's nothing more uh depressing to to get something that you like if, instead of a handwritten note from your boss you get 
a note that you know was written by the secretary or the administrative assistant. I mean, I, I, you know, little yes. things that are very genuinely heartfelt go a long way. Like Rob, and so if you just half ass it, I mean, people see through that right away. So, um, and like Chris said, it, it, highlighting the talent of your staff that, yeah, we're not just the meatheads on the first floor, um, really showing the professionalism that, that your professionals exude and in, in, in how they create value for your athletes and for the rest of the staff in the building. That's, that's super cool if you, can, if you can do that. But it has to be genuine. And that means you have to know your people. You have to really know something about them. Because if you get them a gift card, like if you got me a gift card to some women's store, I would kind of be like, well, that's not, <laughs> you know, like you have to understand who they are and, and what they're all about. And, and sometimes that can go really go awry if it shows that you don't really know them and you're not really um, kind of in the loop with who's working for you. So. Hey, hey Trey, just, yeah. just to, to follow up on the gift card thing, if I have an intern that's working their tail off and they're not making much money, right. and they, let's just say, I'm not trying to meet male show, it's a no. female, and they want to get a mani-pedi, but they can't afford to get it, and you know that, that's yeah. the type of situation yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah, that's ex exactly. Not, not, because then there was a thought process behind it. That's, yes, that's the because, thing yeah. talking about. Because yeah. you know that you know her and you know that she she enjoys that. So mm -hmm. yeah, if some like so get me, you know, if you know I love coffee and tea, like, or give me some good beer, you know, that's <laughs> so I'm just ta I'm talking about that. If you know that that's what that person really enjoys, it shows that you're kind of connected to them. If you get them something that's not totally unrelated to their yep. life that you know it it just kind of shows uh eh, it's, it's it's a challenge i think so let, let's jump into this idea of how do you evaluate people like if you have all your different staff in place and mm -hmm. what is the frequency of evaluate obviously you're evaluating them constantly but as, as far as like a formal let's get together and let's talk about you know how you're doing what are some of the, the metrics you're using, if any, and you know, what, what, what kind of springboards off of that in terms of, well, how do we improve? How do, we, how do, how do you conduct that? So we'll start with Tracy and then we'll go with uh, the other panel members as well. I would say generally you need to evaluate people more than once a year. Um, some of those evaluations have to be um, like literally on the, if, if I'm a strength coach or if I'm a rehab professional, um, watching me work with athletes. I think it's really disappointing when, like my husband's a teacher. And so he gets evaluated up four to six times a year when our administrators come in and they look at his classroom, how he, how he conducts his classroom, how the students are reacting. Um, so you know, someone should be coming and watching me working with athletes. They should be getting feedback from the athletes I'm assigned to or been working with. Um, and then I'm not sure how you, how you score or grade it, but um, I know one of the human resources people that um, I've worked with, uh, she said, you know, what, what should I keep doing? What do I need to stop doing? And what do I need to do better? Those are three things that are, um, I think three ways to talk about how you're doing your job. Um, but I think that, it, you know, the, the one evaluation per year um, that's used by a lot of organizations is not enough. And to see you in your element doing your thing, that needs to be done by, like, how many times do ADs walk into a weight room, at least at the, at the collegiate level? Do they, I mean, it, it just makes me wonder when they say they're surprised that the environment of the football team is not good. That they, did you ever, did you not ever know what was going on there? <laughs> did you not ever see how these people conducted themselves? It's kind of surprising, but, um, but who's ever evaluating has to like have their eyes on you doing your job versus just sitting down at the end of the year 
and talking about what happened. So, Rob, what are your, what are your thoughts on on the evaluation piece, frequency, uh, I think, metrics? I think, there's, I think there's an objective and a subjective component of it. I think that you have to develop some type of scorecard based on. I mentioned this prior in a previous Zoom pop based on what we call MBOs, managed by objectives. And so the staff will have to sit down, the strain staff, the athletic training staff, whatever you, you work with and say, hey, these are the things we have to get better at. And these are the time intervals that I want to see we're getting better at. And so, you know, you may say to an assistant strength coach, I'm going to give you six weeks to improve your ability to coach the Olympic lifts. Because when I watch you coach the Olympic lifts, these are the points that I see that are poor with your athletes. You have a bad transition from the first to the second pole. You, you have, they just don't catch the bar well overall, things like that. And so, or your knowledge of program design is very poor. So I want you to research it and look at things and come back to me. We'll have a discussion in regards to program design and development. Athletic training, you know, the way you rehab this specific pathology is way behind the industry standard. I want you to get, become better at that. You may work with them side by side to help them as a mentor, as a teacher, whatever, but they've got to get better at certain things. And then maybe certain techniques they've evolved with that no one on the staff knew, and now they're giving a presentation. So you have to give them objective things to accomplish and time periods where they're responsible to accomplish the at. The subjective point is, are they bullying in the weight room? Are they communicating? They complete their reports, they complete their scorecards appropriately, but they're always late. Um, they're always late showing up to their teams. They wanna leave early and, they, and the last lifter's left by themselves. So those are subjective components. And I think that you just put the objectivity that you assign to them in the time periods that they had to complete them, these, these, these objectives, along with the, with the subjective feedback, and you come up with a total scorecard, for lack of a better term, and I think you have to meet with them, I agree with Tracy, more than once a year, minimum twice a year. Why? Because unless you meet with them and someone who is not fulfilling your expectations, it's not fair to sit them down with them at the end of the year and say, you know, people are getting awarded this much, but you're not going to get as much when you're talking about raises or bonuses or it may be because you don't do X, Y, and Z well. And now it's December. Well, you didn't tell me. How did I know I needed to work on that? So I do believe you need to meet with them minimum twice a year and probably more frequently, but you need a combination of objectivity. And the objectivity is what gives you accountability, right? Because if they don't do these things, you've got them. You're not being accountable to your job. And then that's a process of, we have to replace you. That's a, that's a process of how much of a reward to give them. That's a process of promotions, right? It'll, it's in writing, it's objective and subjective. So, so you have to develop this, some type of scorecard for lack of a better term. And, and really that should be established once you bring somebody into the fold and hire them, right? You have to have those expectations overtly documented and maybe even have a discussion around that. It's not just their job description, but these are kind of expectations and goals, would you, wouldn't you say? Say that again, I'm sorry. I was just reading your uh, thing that you sent <laughs> You're looking at the bicep size and body composition. Yeah. Um, the, the, when you bring them in, like if you hire somebody from the outset, these expectations yep. should be explicit and documented so that when you do the first evaluation, you have something to refer to, right? Yeah, I mean, and when you bring somebody in from the outside, that's tough too, because is it an hour or three hour interview versus, hey, you know, am I better off hiring one of my interns that have been with me for a year? Or am I better off promoting one of my younger strength coaches? Because I know what I'm going to get on a consistent basis. Now, if you, if you have a void of a skill set, right? We don't have a sports, we don't have a nutritionist. And now I have the budget for a nutritionist. I'm going to hire a nutritionist versus someone who's been on my staff doing it on a part-time basis because of a void that we had, not because it's generally their interest and they're really the best qualified nutritionist out there. And so, you know, how I go to the outside is dependent upon my needs and what I already have on my staff. 
Now, I, I have to bring this up because I shared the poll results and wins and losses got zero out of 12. And, and is that a little bit of a cop out? Is that kind of a bullshit reply? Like nobody picked that. But even bicep and body composition got two. Uh, <laughs> I'm well, sorry. I, <laughs> you, could be, you could be the best in the world. And if you don't, if you don't win, you're going to lose your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, I don't know. Does anybody want to speak to that? Bob Alejo, you made it. Thank you. How was dinner? We got to unmute you there. Fantastic. There. Oh, good for you. I'm happy I for saved, you. Uh, I saved my beer for the post Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I should have had it during the Zoom, but, you know, I, I thought I'd have some semblance of a professional atmosphere. Yeah, I, I put the poll up and it said, you know, what is the most important evaluation criteria and wins and losses was up there and, you know, testing results, injuries, and nobody picked wins and losses. What does that say? Nobody pick wins and losses as a criteria to ball. evaluate an individual. Yeah. It's strength and conditioning. Well, you know, it's, it's ironic because it's like Rob says, absolutely none of us should be picking wins and losses, but we all know that it's probably number one on the flip side. If you're paying the bills, right. Um, there's no doubt about that. I, I've always talked about, you know, trying to get as far as way as you can from the wins and losses, like the medical community is. I think that's important. Um, because that's really the only way we can evaluate ourselves. I mean, I, I know every now and then you can get caught up into, hey, we're winning games, so what I'm doing must be good. I, I think that's a big mistake, just like it is to, to assume that anybody who's winning a lot of games has got a great strength and conditioning program. Um, you know, that's a big assumption, right? But uh, I, I, would, I would think that that would be what I thought would – come out as a poll if I if I thought we were asking us here what that is but it's a uh, it's kind of an ironic uh an ironic poll because that's probably not going to end up being the final judgment yeah so what what you know if, if you're evaluating your let's just say strength and conditioning staff first what are some of the key things you're touching on what, what are you looking at what do you when you bring them into your office and you're going okay we're going to do a full evaluation what are the most important things in your mind to evaluate them on? Well, I've written a few things about this, and uh, I've got another one coming out uh, here pretty soon, I hope. But I, I tell you what you have to do. You've got to already have a standardized amount of metrics. You know, so if you're going to have a real idea of how good you're training the women's volleyball team, there's got to be some metrics involved. Here's what we expect to see, you know, through the programming. And that way, that, that, that becomes indisputable. So how do you get that? Well, you know, every year you have a freshman. And so every year you're going to have freshman data start to compile. And that freshman year will be already standardized for you. So you could look at it and gather, hey, freshmen make, I'm just throwing it out, 10% gain in a squat. Well, we expect to see this. That's the standard that we're holding you to in terms of performance. I mean, the other stuff is, you know, uh, communication skills and all these things that are kind of subjective but there's got to be an objective measure there somewhere um, and that really has to do with just the metrics the athletic performance metrics that's that's why I think we should be called you know if we use any kind of other title than strength and conditioning coach it should be athletic performance because that's the only thing we can control we don't control sports performance I mean it's not my fault if a guy carries the ball 15 times for 20 yards. If I've increased his vertical jump, made him run faster and he's healthy, right? So I think the athletic performance part is the only part we can control. And so what I would say, well, you know, start having these metrics out there where you can say, this is what we should expect in performance, um, you know, field testing and so on and so forth. Then everything else, I mean, there's some subjective things in there too, you know, leadership, uh, continuing education, um, you know, that, that sort of, um, subjective material that also make up a strength coach and that that can be decided upon too but uh I, I think you have to have some sort of metrics because you also have you know be the nicest guy in the world great communicator crappy program right you have a great program but then you can't really educate and, and get people to buy in so that doesn't work either so i think you have metrics to measure by and if we like i put up a poll here um, what about physical therapists? How do you evaluate physical therapists? Like, do you, if you have a lot of injuries, is that on the physical therapist? 
now I could see if there's re-injuries after you return somebody to play. Rob, what do you think? I think you evaluate the physical therapists on, the, on you know, the way they work with the athlete. I think you evaluate the physical therapist in regard to the time they get certain conditions back to, re, you know, to return to play, working with other departments. Um, there are certain objective data. There is objective data out there regarding generalizations, and I will admit it's generalizations, and I do acknowledge individualization. But there is periods of time where you can expect someone to return from a specific injury. And if you can't do that, like, like in our business, and, if, and if, with the involvement of this position, I think this is real important. You know, there are, we do outcome measures. And so we know by therapist, by clinic, by region, for specific diagnosis, whether operative or non-operative, how long it takes on average for someone to get better. And insurance companies, add to the limitation on that. And, and elite athletes cannot go by the standard of the general population, I get it. But you would be able to work with a company, I'm sure, that does outcomes, that you would be able to evaluate and work to evaluate, to establish standards for various pathologies on elite athletes. And do your, does your medical staff measure up to these outcomes? If someone should get better in six weeks, are they better in six weeks? If they should be better in, in one, one week, are they better in one week? And, and you, you have to have some type of objective measure with this. And you also would evaluate, okay, as you're going through this process, what are their skills and, and the modalities they're using, if appropriate, whatever, to, to enhance their return to play, to get back on the field? Are they limited in those capacities? And do they have to be taught? So, so maybe they're just not that good due to inexperience because you just hired somebody out of school, or maybe they're a 10 year therapist that doesn't have 10 years of experience. They have one year, 10 times, and they're not any better. But, and so those are the types of things I'd look for. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because on the, um, sorry, I'm going to end the poll and publish the results here so people can see, um, but it, it, I'm a little happier with these results because it said, you know, more people thought that return to play timelines and re-injury incidents were probably the best indicators, which I would tend to agree with. Um, but I didn't put wins and losses on there because I, I just didn't think that was uh, that was going to be that was going to be a non-starter. But um, how about these cases where, like, if you look at the return to play timelines and people go, oh, well, he pulled his hamstring, he's going to be out four to six weeks when that's you know, maybe that's an unrealistic uh, timeline to set so that you can look like a hero. Um, what do you think about that? Who, who, I mean, because usually it's going to be the medical person that's going, oh, it's going to take this long. You know, what do you think about that, Rob? I think there's two parts to that. I think there's reality and there's what you want the media to know. And so if you get them back early, you look like a star. And you could, you could do it both ways, right? You could always pad it so when the guys get better earlier, you look good, or you can be realistic and say, no guarantees, but you know, this is the timeline we're gonna go. And I don't know if I would give that information publicly. I would definitely give that information to my staff and my superiors and, and evaluate it on a daily process. But you have to come up with some kind of plan and progression. You just can't say, today we're gonna go out and run 50 yard striders. Tomorrow we're just gonna squat. I mean, you can't make, you know, crap soup, right? So essentially, you know, there, there are, there is information that you should pretty, you pretty well know when someone, give or take, should be back in most conditions. You're definitely going to have your outliers, but. And yeah, Tra people. Tracy, what are your thoughts on that about publicly saying we're going to have them back at this, you know, it's, that's a four to six week injury or that's a six month ACL. What are your thoughts about making that public as opposed to just keeping a mm. lid on it and going, see how it goes? Uh, well, every case is kind of individual and you don't know what all, all of the variables involved in, in each particular case. So I think um, being more uh, quiet about it, if you, if you can at all not be public about it because expectation, you know, if, once you set that expectation, you can't take that back. So, and you never know what's going to happen in the process. 
you, I think you should have your own internal metrics because you're aware of what's going on, but um, making things public, that's, that's really tough, I think. Yeah, does anybody have any, anybody else have some thoughts on the whole uh, return to play um, efficacy issue? Like, uh, what is fair? What is, you know, if somebody, I mean, is it, it fair to, to look at timelines? And if somebody's a little, a week later, you know, should, you, should we focus more on the efficacy of the return as opposed to how long it took? Because maybe it required that extra time. Dean, Dean, do you want to jump in? Like, you know, obviously we want to bring people back quickly. But do, don't we want that to be a resilient, you know, return? Dean? <clears throat> yeah, 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 thanks. Um, How do yeah. you balance that off? Well, I mean, I think one of the main, one of the biggest concerns um, when I'm bringing an athlete, um, when we set a timeline, like we have to, I'm talking to all team members involved, right? And I think that was one of the criteria that you listed on one of your polls was, does he communicate effectively with the rest of the team? So I want to know, I, I want to know exactly what's going on with the rest of the team. And does that align with what I'm trying to set up in terms of my goals for that athlete, for RTS? I think one of the biggest things that we haven't discussed here, and I don't mean to tangent too much on this, and I do want to answer your question here, is... Um, there is a uh, psychological aspect to injury that I don't think mechanical mechanically we we address we don't we don't look at this enough um, when we're dealing with RTS um, and um, the biggest con one of the biggest concerns I have with getting that athlete uh, being able to understand what a return to sport looks like is his fear base around what Rob and I love this term that Rob uses kinesiophobia I'm using it now by the way Rob on this uh with my with my I just started using it. I love it um but I'm 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 we're actually bringing in more psychological support for our guys because statistically and historically um through the research uh when you're adding that combination into your mechanical rehab, you're, we see our RTS timelines uh, improve actually, and resiliency improves. So, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be vague here. I'm sorry, I'm swirling here because I'm listening to what what you guys have been saying, Tracy and Rob and Bob and these guys, and, and about about the whole team thing and the interdisciplinary support that is absolutely necessary. Is it fair to put this on one person or one 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 uh, individual? Like, is it the PT? Rob said it as well, and I don't mean to keep using Rob's examples, but there has to be one leader here. Um, and who do we put that on? Who sets those outcome measures um, that that decide that? For me personally, uh, there are. Uh, insurers have, have listed it. This is well documented that insurers have set uh, timelines. You know, uh, a rotator cuff post-surgical repair should be this long. Um, you know, a post-surgical cervical whatever should be this long. And, and that's fair enough. Those are averages. But, um, you know, let's face it, there's a whole heck of a lot of pressure on myself for sure when i'm trying to get an athlete back um i take a lot of that on myself and it's not just about it's not, to me it's not just about um getting them back uh quickly the resilience beyond that is extremely important uh how, and once again getting back to my psychological example um, we're trying to bring in more psychological support here for these guys because this, this, uh, I do not want my athlete, the last thing they should be thinking about on the ice or on the pitch or on the field or whatever it is, is, is about their injury. Um, so I don't know. Sorry, bro. I, I don't know if that answers your question. No, that's, or... that's good. And I, I want to throw this at Bob Alejo because, you know, this team aspect is obviously what we're talking about. And, and Bob and I go back and forth over like, what is the role of the strength and conditioning coach in this process? 
Uh, it's not just the weight room meathead. It's somebody who's going to help that has the knowledge to, to provide that transition and return to play. But do you think Bob that, you know, the, the strength coach could be a leader in this? Absolutely. And, and I say this without bias, it sounds like totally contradictory. I think, I think a, a seasoned strength and conditioning professional is probably the best candidate to be the high performance director because we cross pollinate with everybody. You know, if you think about what we've done, Rob, you can jump in too on this, but, but think about, um, you know, we're always going to find out what are you doing, athletic trainer? What are you doing at sports psych? What are you doing, massage therapist? What you, I've rarely had anybody come to me in the pro setting, the collegiate setting, the, you know, whatever, come to me and say, where's your periodization plan? What's your schedule? Where were they? Where are they going? How are they doing? So we, we're always part of those other processes. So my education came from working with Rob. My education came by working with Ernie Farrell in the Olympic Games. My education came from Barry Weinberg. Um, so I know how those things should look and what they should be doing. And also Rob answered that question, you know, weeks back when said like, you don't have to be an expert in any of those things to be the director of high performance, but you certainly need to know a little bit about every one of those things. So, um, you know, is it a PhD? I, I think historically I, I find that difficult to imagine that a PhD has spent so much time in the field with every one of those people to have an idea of what that's supposed to look like. Um, an athletic trainer, you know, I, I, they're part of the performance group, but at the same time, they're not involved in performance. In other words, once they've got the re ankle rehabbed, that guy doesn't go play. That guy comes to me. And then we send them out after I've got them to fitness levels. So, you know, every one of those aspects are important. We get that reflected on us so much that we, we know a little bit about nutrition and therapy and all this other stuff happening. I, I think we're really good candidates for it, but I think it's got to be somebody who's been around for a while to actually have known that. And, and as I do, I don't think it's impossible for other sectors to be to run it, but I do think somebody in that position, they got to be around, I think, for a solid 15, 20 years. I don't think you can just jump right in there. I think you need to have seen, I don't think you need to have seen it all, but by the time you finish the job you got, you're going to have to have seen it all. Um, Rob, what do you think about that? You know, I, we, we talked a little bit before. Um, I, I, um, I said there were, there were three components, right? There's athletic performance, strength and conditioning, whatever term you want to use, and everything that falls under that umbrella. You have athletic training falls under that umbrella, and you have the physicians. I think it's important, you, you've got to have someone who's a leader and who could communicate and, and bring the three departments, for lack of a better term, together. Now, the advantage that someone with a medical background has is that they probably have dealt with the doctors and they're doing the rehab, right? So they may know nothing about strength and conditioning, but they, they know two of the three silos. But I agree with you, it doesn't have to be a medical professional. And, and experience is a role. And experience is a role, not just in knowledge, but experience is a role how to deal with people. It really it's important. Um, so that's how I feel about it. Someone's got to be able to bring it all together. And you can only have one person in charge. I Chris, believe that as well. Chris, do you, have, do you have something to add to that in terms of, you know, the roles that people have? And, and, and if we talk about the return to play piece, how, how, are, your, how are your strength coaches involved? Sorry, um, it, it depends on the sport. And uh, we have, so we have our sports medicine staff and then we have two physical therapists also that work within the department. So they'll handle the, a lot of the early stage rehab and then end up passing the athlete off to uh, whoever their athletic trainer is to take them through the rest of the rehab. And then depending on the sport, there will be some, there could be some strength coach involvement with the very back end or end of return to play and uh, getting them prepared to jump back on the field or court, whatever it may be. Um, but like, like Rob said, I think you have to have somebody that that's kind of orchestrating all that and, and, uh, getting everybody pointed in the right direction and, and, uh, leading everybody and setting some directives on where to go. Hey, Derek. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's important to point out, there are no absolutes, right? We have guidelines, but there are no absolutes. And the other thing is you can't do anything without a plan. 
And that plan's gonna change as you go through the progression. So you're gonna have in your plan at these periods of the rehab process, this is the sports nutrition's role, the trainer's role, the therapist's role, the strength coach's role, et cetera, at these particular points going through this progression. As, as uh, Dean said before, if, if someone's fearful of something, well, listen, as we're going through this progression, they won't load that leg. All right, well, maybe we need to get more input and more of a um, pr you know, percentage of the role from the sports psych, because there's obviously a fear factor or something going on here. A lot of feedback's gonna go on as you go through this progression, but you need to have a plan. And, and again, we just have to remember, there are no absolutes, just like individualization, et cetera. But if you have 100 athletes, you're, you're pretty sure where the majority are gonna fall. So. Yeah. Now, one question I have, like we're, we've had some really good discussion and we're getting close to the end here, but one question I have is, how do you, as a performance director, um, maintain job security for your staff and yourself so if you have, I know in, obviously in college football, if you have head coaching changes, pro football, pro, pro sports, you have head coaching changes. What are you doing to make sure that you retain your position and also the position of your staff? Now it's difficult sometimes in the case of a strength coach who falls directly under the, the head coach and not, maybe not under the performance director. Um, but what kind of things can you do to build a case to say like, hey, yeah, we were 500 this year, but, you know, these are some other metrics we're looking at to show that we're doing a good job and maybe it's personnel, maybe it's something else. Um, Tracy, do you want to start? And then we'll, we'll get the other panel mem members to start uh, uh, and contribute as well. Hmm, I, um, I don't know, maybe I should, I'm not that familiar with the collegiate setting. So I, I don't even know, like, how did foot, you know, you're mostly talking about football, right? The Olympic sports staffs, sports staffs are pretty set because they're, they're, they're separate from their coaches and their teams, right? Are they like four-year cycles, though, uh, for the most part? You mean? Yeah, like do you have contracts that, like, that go for maybe like four years to the next Olympics? Because I, I also uh, have, you know, some coaches who are in, some, you know, different Olympic um, uh, sports. No, we, we didn't really have any – we didn't have any contracts actually oh, okay. um okay. no um at least with u.s ski and snowboard um but yeah i wonder if, if that's a so so keeping the high performance department separate from the coaching hires i don't you know how did how did american football get such that the strength coaches were always hired and brought with the football coach how did that become different than the other sports what I'll what let, is it just yeah. money is that just money or what is it i'll let chris roof uh, start with that one you know how you know how did that happen chris and then how do is it something that can be changed in your opinion so that the performance team is the performance team and not the football team oh um, i think yeah money is a big part of it uh, as as football grew and grew uh, there was obviously a lot higher stakes from a financial standpoint for, for the university and the coaches involved. And I think one thing that we all have to realize is that uh, coaches are going to want people around them that they're comfortable that they can trust will do what they need them to do so that they can uh, coach their team at a high level and prepare their team to be the best they can be. And, and um, that's not always exclusive to, to, or, in opposition of good performance staffs either. I mean, um, I think the peop there's a lot of times people say, well, yeah, I'd like more job security or not having to be tied to a coach or whatever. And that sounds great until you got to work for a coach that is really bad to work for because your job is so secure that you're not going to, you're not going to move somewhere. So there's from a performance coach's standpoint, there's a lot of, good to be had uh, knowing who you're working with and that you your, yourself and the coaches that you work with values are aligned and, and are of the sim similar mindset and you can still do a great job that way. Uh, I, can it change? I don't know that it will anytime soon. I'm never say never, but um, you know, the football machine is a, is a big thing and creates a lot of revenue and uh, head coaches want that 
freedom to have people around them that they can trust on a day-to-day basis. Much like Rob said, when you hire that person, you know what you're going to get out of them every single day. Yeah. Bob, do you have uh, some thoughts on that and and the the regime changes and attaching yourself to a coach and what is the value in in doing that as opposed to maybe just growing your skill set and and doing a good job and well, I think the way you I think the way you separate yourself and get your security is where you report like, like I did to Billy Bean directly to the GM. Or if you're in collegiate setting, you you report directly to the athletic director. You you don't you don't directly go to a, an associate athletic director unless it's the one I've been talking about, where it's somebody like me or Rob or you, you know, where you know we we can hold a spot and be able to speak to what this performance group can do. Uh, but listen, I, I think, you know, yeah, I, I would say Chris out, it's a hundred percent money. It's not 98 or 95. It's a hundred percent the money. They're paying that coach a lot of money. He's saying, I'm coming. Here's my guys. Nobody tells them no. And here's the sad part. They don't tell them no to run guys at noon in hundred degrees humidity. They don't tell them no to bully them. They don't tell them no. And this is where the problem begins. hundred percent. And so you got to be able to separate yourself out. And this is the conversation that you have when you have the right athletic director and the right general manager is this is how we're doing it. It's to protect you coach. So when you say, I got my guy, we want to say this guy's terrific after we vet him. We're not going to hire him because you say so we're going to vet him. And then we want to be able to say, God, what a great hire. The other thing we're not saying is, and that and that sort of setup is, I, I'm not saying we're not going to hire a great strength coach. I'm saying we're not hiring that strength coach. He's an endangerment to the student athletes, or you know, in another situation. So, like in my situation at the pro level, you know, I I knew as long as we were meeting the metrics that Rob was talking about that my job was going to be fine. And, and so it was, because we stunk for a long time before we were money ball. So it certainly, you know, wasn't that our team was winning games and that's why I kept my job. It was because we were doing the right thing. You know, we were bringing in the right players. They were healthy, compliant in the weight room, good training program, get all this other stuff. And so the, the, I think the gap ends up widening when you don't report to an athletic director, in fact, you report to a senior associate athletic director who sometimes doesn't report directly to them. And now this thing gets super wide. Now coaches are starting to tell you, hey, Chris, we're not, I don't want my volleyball girls to do squat. And there ain't a damn thing you can do with it, right? And so that's why you need that separate group. Now, it's, you know, what's first, the chicken or the egg? You, you have, you can't do that unless you're supported by the AD. You can't do that unless you're supported by the GM. So you have to have that person in place for this sort of thing to happen. Yeah, and we've talked about this before where we have to actively advocate for the the superiority of having a good team and a good uh, high performance department exclusive of the coaching staff. But obviously you want the coaching staff to agree that yes, this is the best way to go. You know, we vetted the, all the people properly. You know, this isn't about, you know, appointing people to the su- Supreme Court. Sorry, I had right. to throw that in. But, um, you know, it's it's about, you know, doing this properly and making sure we have the the approval of the head coach who understands like, hey, this is the best thing. I don't know a lot about strength and conditioning, but it, it's kind of the ego that, you know, Rob had talked to about before that gets in the way of all of this. Yeah, so, I would agree with you. Well, I think... You know, I think the unfortunate uh, the, the unfortunate circumstance in Maryland, I think when they finish all their investigations, this is going to be critical for the strength and conditioning profession, if not the entire performance team. And I think, you know, I'm a little more optimistic than Chris is. I think it's going to happen at some point where they're going to be separated off. I even got a call from a longtime athletic trainer who said, have you ever thought about getting separate the, from the university? In other, in other words, employed by the university but you know somehow separate as a medical entity that entire group trainer massage therapist nutritionist all of that that way you're you know you're totally separate 
It'd be like the compliance department now. They're not employed by the athletic department. They're employed by the university. That, that was changed in the last five years. Because hmm. there was an obvious conflict of interest there if, you know, if you're a departmental employee in terms of not representing it, the, it, at least at state, what they did, now the compliance director reported directly to the chancellor, not the athletic director. So. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's try to wrap this up here. Let's go through and, Rob, do you have any final thoughts on what we've discussed and, and maybe how do we advocate for, you know, better performance teams that, that, that have this sort of autonomy to make the right decision and best decisions for the organization, the team, the college, the, you know, and whatnot. Before I, do, before I do that, I just want to jump in just sort of statement of what you just asked. I think you can't worry about things you can't control. That's just a waste of time, right? And so no one is irreplaceable, but some people are more difficult to replace than others. And in, whether it's your staff or yourself, if you can bring a, an entity as one unit instead of silos, right? It's the strength and conditioning department. We're bringing in our own strength coach. It's an athletic, we're bringing in our own trainer. If your department works harmoniously by removing cogs, you disrupt that department. And if you do a real good job with regards to athletic performance, injury prevention, and then return to play, and you could show that data. So the game of football, I don't believe you can control injury. What you can control is the optimal time to return to play as an overall number, not one individual, the outlier, but over four years, we had a hundred of these injuries and we ranked top in the conference in return to play in regards to time lost. If you can present objective data like that and have a team of people working well together, that is something that people are gonna have second thoughts about breaking up. No guarantees, but if you can establish that, it would give people something to think about, especially the next head coach coming in, because if they think it was just the coaches that couldn't win the game, and they replace that part, that may be the missing piece. If they replace that and replace your staff and you and everybody else with great standards and great objective data, they may be replacing two things. They may, re finish, they may replace the coach and got that fixed, but now they're starting all over with the strength and conditioning, athletic performance, rehab, et cetera. So if the players respect you, the players are excited about it, the coaches that were there excited about it, the faculty is excited about it, the AD knows you, and it is about relationships. Don't kid yourself. As Bob stated, his relationship with Billy Bean, that's what you can control and that's what you can do. But it just can't be opinion, 100% opinion. You have to show them, all right? And just as far as closing, I, mean, I don't know what else I could tell you. I think there's gotta be one person in charge. I think you, it doesn't have to be the best in the country. I think you have to have a number of people that are good enough to do the job well, but can fit as a team. You have to know every day that whatever level of performance of the, or whatever level of capability your staff has, they're giving you 100% every day. So you may not have the greatest individuals, but you have the greatest team. And then I think you need to hold them accountable. And you have to hold them accountable both objectively and subjectively. And I think you have to reward them, whether it's simply as praise or raises and bonuses at the end of the year or, you know, whatever it may be. And you have to give them credit for the work they do. It's not about us. It's about the team. And if you do that, you will have a bigger spotlight on you as the leader than if you were a me guy. Good, good points, Rob. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, you had mentioned uh, the NBA example of building things from the ground up. What are your thoughts in closing? I think it's an interesting opportunity for these individuals, say like Dave Tenney or Dan Martin, who have been hired to specifically rebuild and recreate a new uh, an environment for these organizations and can handpick who, who they want to be on their team. And it's interesting to see how they develop because it's, it's definitely, I think, a bigger challenge to, you know, pluck people on, put them on a, an existing team with existing, you know, maybe communication challenges or physical challenges or whatever. So it's, it's kind of an interesting experiment to, 
time to see some of these professional teams and even at the collegiate level when they're they're forming these new assistant ad positions for athlete health and wellness and sort of changing the whole um oversight of the athletic department it's a like uh bob said it's a it's a very interesting time right now and there could be some really good significant developments in how we look after these people and how people interact and accountability and oversight and professionalism um, but you don't often have the opportunity to blow something up and start all over um, but some of the pro teams have, have you know kind of done that and so it's kind of interesting to watch yes definitely i'm going to be watching uh, a lot of these teams very closely uh chris um do you think you could if you had a strong leader and you integrate people is that is that possible is that good enough or do you have to blow things up sometimes i don't think you have to blow things up um we're we're going through this right now uh we have uh, kenny boyds our senior associate ad for student athlete health and wellness and he's been inserted in to oversee and manage everything. And it's, um, I'm sure he wouldn't say it's gone seamless, but uh, from our standpoint, it's, uh, it's been a pretty smooth transition adding that in. And uh, now we have had some turnover on our staff, uh, not related to that over the last uh, year, but um, I don't think you have to blow things up at the, at the collegiate level. If you have good people in place, then uh, I think those people will, gravitate towards what needs to be done for the organization to, to function within that new framework at a high level. Yeah. And uh, Bob, what do you have to add to just to close here? Yeah. Hey, Chris, I had a question for you. Is that associate athletic director have any experience in performance at all, like on the ground? He's uh, been an athletic trainer. So that's his, his uh, background in sports med. Gotcha. Okay. You got well, about you that, 20 years of experience. That's probably better than most. You know, I mean, that's certainly a, a, a step in the right direction. Uh, I, I would say this, that uh, like Rob said, you know, the, the leader of the orchestra, right? The conductor, uh, I think is what he said a few weeks back. You know, uh, performance and, and athlete health and welfare is not, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's not, not to be compromised. Like it's not up for a vote. It's not up to make everybody happy. And so it's, it's got to be, here's how we're going to do things, and here's how the order is going to be. There's no diplomacy in performance. There's no diplomacy in health and safety. So that person who's running that group has to immediately identify this person is not on board. You got about a minute to get on board, and then that's it. I mean, that's, that's got to be, and it's got to be swift. I'm not saying you have to go in and wipe anybody out. I've, I've heard it from, you know, big time executives on both ends. I like to wait a little while because I just got here. And, and like in my case, in state, for instance, if I'd wiped everybody out there, I would have had no connection to what had ever happened. No, no archive. On the other hand, I talked to some, you know, GMs and presidents who said, you know, I made a mistake by not doing that the last place. So I did it here because I know what I got and I know what's going on. But for sure, whoever it is, when you get in that spot, you got to move now and you got to move swift. It, it, you don't, so it's not like an, it's not like accounting where you can kind of wait for a little while for this person to, to get rolling and get the math down. Right. If you do that in our business, the, the risk just starts escalating. Right. It doesn't, you know, cause you're dealing with heartbeats. So that, that would be my only suggestion on uh, running that performance group. That's a, that's a good point. You drop back into the pocket, you wait for things to develop too long. <laughs> it's not going to end well. No doubt. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. This was good. I just, I just wish we had more people on board because I thought the, the discussion was top notch. So thanks for everyone who participated and uh, joined today. And uh, I'll, I'm, I, I'm thinking of just publishing this whole thing uh, publicly just because I, I, I want to help create awareness, just like some of the other topics we had. So, um, you know, as, uh, I'll, I'll do some careful edits and things here and there, but, you know, we can just put it out there and just get people talking about how we can put together these teams and advocate for them. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks, sir. Thank everybody. you, everybody. Thanks, Take Derek. care.